Memory core. Okay. All right, so we want to thank everyone that's on here for uh, Environmental Fridays. This is uh, season six, and this is our fourth episode of season six. If you do wish to look at the entire schedule for season six and even retro to our previous season, you could click on that link or you can use the QR code in the right side, right corner. That will get you to our schedule and speakers bio. So we have today, um, just a quick preview of our February. This is our first um, episode for February and we will be hearing from Joseph Karanga. I spelled his name wrong in here. It should be a J instead of a G. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have it spelled correctly in the other things, I believe. And he will be talking to us about environmentalism and um, the role that indigenous and local knowledge should play uh, in, in that. Then next week, Quincy Edwards, I believe from St. Kitts, will be talking to us about emerging contaminants in Caribbean waters. Following that, on the 16th, we'll hear about the effect of air pollution on child brain development. And then to close out February, we will hear from Sonia Gupta on the impact of environment on human health. So our guest speakers today, our, sorry, co-hosts today, uh, Danielle, a colleague of mine here in a different department, but a colleague nonetheless here at Andrews University, Danielle and our other co-host, uh, Stacy, um, which I consider uh, to be a friend. We've known each other now maybe about a year, so she's a recent friend, <laughs> a friend nonetheless. Um, so I will start with Daniel. Could you give us a short, <laughs> interesting thing that about yourself that you're very passionate about? Sure. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, for me, that's very easy. I am a biologist. I'm a field biologist, and I am deeply passionate about marine mammals, and in particular. I spend a lot of time thinking about sirenians, which are dugons and manatees. Nice. So that's occupies my mind. Nice. So you are out there on the sea, in rivers, and I'm stuck in a lab, which I enjoy. <laughs> but well, <yeah. laughs> like you, I teach most of the year. And right. when I can escape, I do try to make my way to warmer waters, which is where these animals live both in freshwater uh, habitats as well as marine habitats. So um, yes, I, I do venture out every once in a while when they let me. Okay, very good, very good. And Stacy, same thing? Hey there. Okay, Hi. so I think, well, my background is multidisciplinary, which is in law, um, education, climate activism, and climate justice. So my passion is definitely climate justice and young people. I did, however, want to be a biologist when I grew up. I will say <laughs> that's Daniel. Like my hero hey, to watch we'll that you. graphic. And I used to dream about going off into the far flung corners of the world just to, uh, and I love animals to this day. And I love surfing. It's like one of my big, big hobbies. So it's great to see marine life out there when I surf. So I think that's my passion. It's, you know, making sure that voices are heard and particularly those that are marginalized. So I think, um, or, or guest speaker, the role of indigenous knowledge, I think is a really crucial um, talking point we can explore today. Yes, very good, very good. So thank you both. And you will be hearing from each one of them more later on. Next, um, I want to introduce our short guest special feature, uh, Marcia Tinto, also, a newly acquired friend over this past Christmas, I believe. Yes, yeah. so she was a Christmas gift. <laughs> While I was back home in Trinidad, we connected. And um, 
She will give us our short presentation today. So the floor or the screen is now yours, Marcia. She's okay. a environmental educator in the Environmental Management Authority, I believe in the Ministry of Planning. Planning and Development. Yeah. Yes. And development. Yes. In so planning. this we are we are statutory body. Um, Did he record this yet? Yes, we are recording. Launch Zoom meeting. Oh, okay. So I'm trying to share my screen now. Are you seeing okay. it? The, not yet, but okay. It's coming up. All right. Okay. All right, we okay. see that. So, so we've seen right. all your upcoming you slides. Give you a so do a full. Okay. Yes. So should I start now? Uh yes. But you your slides, we seen your upcoming slides. Do you want to do a full? No, I want to. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Um yes, we share it. Oh, what's going on here? I need to do um share the entire PowerPoint. Yeah, the full screen. Where can I? My apologies, I'm keeping everyone. If, if not, it's 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 okay. I mean, um, I I'm trying to find full screen, but I'm not seeing it. Um, it okay. might be on the slide. It's at the bottom where the slider is. There's like a little that icon right before the little minus. Um, bottom right. Oh, okay. Bottom right. Bottom this, this right. Here. Yeah. Hmm. I seem to see my at the at the bottom. It's my to current window, correct? Is that that? Yes. 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 Okay. So, is it working now? Not yet. Hmm. Oh, she hit the zoom. Don't. Oh. Don't hit the zoom. Okay. Mm -mm. No. No, it was the, the little button. At the bottom right. Well, uh, it says fix right there, to go, current window. Go to the left. Go to the left. I think the one. Alternatively, the she can also hit the one that says underneath file from beginning. Okay. Okay. Underneath file. From beginning. File well, from beginning. All the way yes. left. As I would normally do it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. There you Perfect. go. Yeah. All good. Okay. Perfect. So I'm going to get started and run through this very quickly. So the Environmental Management Authority, um, we were set up by the government on the 5th of June 1995 under an act of parliament, which is called the Environmental Management Act, um, Chapter 3505. And the purpose of setting up the EMU was to coordinate environmental management functions, um, because at that time there were ad hoc um, you know, um, organizations, agencies who had environmental portfolios, and it was about bringing everyone together under one umbrella to really coordinate and advise and facilitate. Um, so it's basically about looking at development and managing the balance between environment and development. Of course, the social component is also um, part of the sustainability of the organization. So I'm going right into the public education unit. Um, just a little history. I'm not going to read all of this um, about environmental education, which we had started in 1977, the concept anyway, at the Tillisby uh, Declaration. And really, it's about a process to make people aware of environmental issues and problems, giving them the attitude, the knowledge, the skills, the motivation, and all the rest of it to work together or collectively, individually um, to find solutions. Then in 1987, the UN um, commissioned, um, the World Commission on Environment and Development came up with the Brundtland Report. Um, the head of that um, committee at the time was Gro Harlem Brundtland, who was the then Prime Minister of Norway, hence the reason it's called the Brundtland Report. So it looks at what was going on, how humans were impacting the environment. And then the really big um, climate meeting, I would say, of the century, was um, the Earth Summit in uh, Rio in 1992, where Agenda 21 was adopted, where governments decided that it's like a, a blueprint to 
take into consider into consideration global, regional, and local areas where humans are impacting the environment. Um, going into Agenda 21, Chapter 36, so basically it's a definition of what environmental education should be doing. So promoting education, awareness, um, training, um, sustainable development, and of course, building the capacity of people to address environmental problems, as I had said earlier, right? Um, I'm not gonna go through all of this. Again, there was another the 1997 International Conference on Adult Education, and this now took education, environmental education outside of the formal schooling aspect and looked at informal and non-formal. So informal will be something like we're doing now where you, for example, will go on to um, a website or so on and you get information. Um, you go on to social media pages and you get information. So it's not acquiring information or education in a formal way. And non-formal will be outside of the school setting where we will have community meetings and so on. So again, learning, and this is particularly to enable adults. So it's not just, again, students. And then 98, we had the advisory panel on education for sustainable development. And they talked about the same sort of thing. So it has all been um, reinforced through some of these agreements and some of these declarations. And of course, um, not to um, repeat, but the Brennan, um Commission came up with the, the concept or the term for uh, sustainable development, which is sustaining sustainable development, meeting the needs of our present generation without compromising future generations to meet their own needs. So it's all about conservation and wise use of resources. Okay, so getting into what we do, um, we do almost everything in terms of outreach and education. Um, so we do exhibitions, for example, um, exhibitions with companies, with uh, schools, with private sector, um, with community groups. Um, it doesn't really matter. I'd like to always quote the, um, the Star Trek, we go everywhere where no man has gone before. And we have really touched every nook and cranny in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we also do lectures and workshops, and of course, in a formal setting as well as informal. And we have an environmental club program which started in 1998 for both uh, primary and secondary schools, where we give the students the capacity to come up with um, initiatives and projects um, which are relevant to trending global environmental issues. Um, well, recently in 2021, we appointed the National Focal Point for ACE. This was adopted at the COP in Glasgow in 2021. Um, ACE meaning Action for Climate Empowerment. And these are the elements of ACE education, training, public awareness, which we've been doing before, but most important, public access to information, public participation, and of course, international cooperation where there is partnership. And we also do sociocultural reviews of environmental impact assessments because one of our functions at the EME is um, as regulator. So there's subsidiary legislation under the Environmental Management Act, which I spoke about before, where um, um, applicants, if they're doing any kind of activity that may impact the environment, they do have to apply. So for example, under the Certificate of Environmental Clearance Rules, the CCs, um, and those of you, I know um, both Data and Pat McGraw here, and they're very familiar with the EIA process, which is where um, if the, the project needs to be, it's on a very large scale, um, an environmental impact assessment has to be done. And we're part of the review committee. This is the public education unit where we look at the social, sociocultural aspects of the, um, the project. Um, we also have the biennial Green Leaf Awards, which is really to award persons who have done um, considerable work in the field of environment. And each year we have a, a theme. Um, last year, as I said, it's biennial, so it's every two years. So last year it was on youth, um, climate change and youth. So they presented projects, whether it would have been videos, um, um, work that they're doing, collaborative work. And um, it's, it's something that I think many people look forward to. And then um, I spoke about ACE again, not sure what, why that came there. 
And what we do, again, provide technical, because as I said earlier on, the EMA is also an advisory body. We just don't clamp down on people and give them permits. Um, we do what I'm doing right now, which is public education. So some of the, some, not all, of the organizations that we may provide um, technical advice to would be like the UNDP, FAO, you know, United Nations Information Center, some of the government ministries, agencies, municipal corporations, civil society groups, which is very broad, industry, private sector, and as well as education institutions. Right, um, collaborating with other units within the organization. So, for example, some of the units we have with biodiversity um, projects. So the Manatee, by the way, um, Dr. Gonzalez, I believe, Oh, Daniel, if you don't mind me saying, um, nope. the manatee what? is one. The manatee is one of the the species that we have protected under the environmentally sensitive species rules, and of course the area where it occurs in Trinidad Tobago, which is the Nariva Swamp. And um, we also have an information center, which is more like stationary or more public education. So students, anyone from the public can come in there, and um, it's a resource center where you can get information. Um, if you look behind on the cabinets, you'll see the Science National Register, and this is where those applications for noise and the CCs and so on. So any member of the public who is interested in what has been presented, or what has been um, submitted to the EME can come in. And that's, of course, for transparency and that we can also engage the public in making comments on the EIA process or whatever else they are um, interested in or are concerned about. And that's it. I hope I did the 10 minutes. Okay. So that's our <laughs> mission, stewards of Trinidad and Tobago's natural resources, meeting current and future human ecological and economic needs. And we have been certified by ISO 9001. So we have to include the um, logos there and we are on all the social media. So thank you. Thank you. I'll thank stop. you very much. Very good. Hope so um, what we... What we would like um, is possibly one question and we have to move on. And just to also say that Marcia Tinto has already agreed to be one of our full length speakers for next season. So you will hear a lot more from her and, and possibly also from some of her colleagues. But is there at least one question or comment before we move on to uh, Joseph's uh, presentation. No question. I would like to thank Marcia. That is a very, very good overview and is great. But I would also like to mention just a little dig for everybody concerned that coming out of the 1992 Rio, Rio there was also something which was called, uh, which gave freedom of information um, and gave information the right for a civil society to have, um, to get information, um, participate and justice in environmental matters. Mm -hmm. That then became what's known as the Escatsu Agreement, mm -hmm. which became, um, uh, I'm not putting this very well, I'm not very verbal. Uh, the Escatsu Agreement is a regional agreement, Latin American and the Caribbean, and um, they are pushing this right, these rights for particularly for civil society on environmental matters. And on that strength, I would like to say that the EMA comes up very high in my estimation. That um, I am a regular visitor, well, not a visitor now, but was a regular visitor to the information center. And they now provide me digitally with any information that I ask. They are extremely helpful. And yeah, no, I would say that on the whole, the EMA does try very hard to do what it's supposed to do. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. There you go, Marcia. <laughs> <laughs> very good work. So thank you very much. And I know you and I will continue to be in touch and collaborate. So Definitely. next, okay, thank you. So next we have, everyone seen this slide, my slide? Our main speaker, Joseph Karanga, 
And he will be now introduced by uh, Stacy. Thanks everyone. Well, it's great um, to be here and to be able to introduce um, a person who I think is really fundamental in us learning about sustainability and the real origins of sustainability. Um, thanks so much to Joseph Karanja for being here. He is the Associate Project Officer at UNESCO's Local and Indigenous Knowledge Systems Program, which is also called LINCS. So he leads the support unit for that and the Biodiversity Ecosystem Services Network. And I think what is really great about what Joseph does is that he interweaves um, Indigenous local knowledge with work streams and ensures that policies integrate this kind of knowledge. And to be honest, I can see a lot of what's happening now, sustainability is something that was always part and parcel of Indigenous communities and Indigenous culture. It's kind of been, to me, rebranded and westernized and renamed something else, but it's something that always existed. So I think acknowledging this is a way to help us to reclaim it and put it more at the forefront. Um, Joseph is also a lecturer at the Ma Maasai Mara University in Kenya, and he spearheaded research on local sustainability and resilience there. He holds his PhD in Sustainable Environmental Studies from the University of Tsushima and his Master of Science in Sustainability Service from the United Nations University. So on that note, we would love to hear you, Joseph. We look forward to your presentation. Thanks again for being with us. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stacey, for that uh, great introduction. Uh, so I'll bring up my presentation. Um, let me know when you can see my full screen. Yes, we can. Yes, you can see the full screen. Um, okay. it's, yes, it's indeed a great pleasure for me to participate in these uh, environmental days. And uh, Desmond was asking people what they are passionate about. Um, but yes. probably already everyone knows what I'm passionate about. But <laughs> now I'm going to tell you something maybe unique about me. Six is my favorite number. So I'm really uh, thrilled to participate in the sixth um, <laughs> season of this uh, uh, okay. of this episode. So thank you so much, uh, Desmond, for uh, for inviting me. Um, as Stacy clearly indicated, I'm part of the team, uh, UNESCO team on the local and indigenous knowledge systems that I'll uh, briefly talk about. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, so. Uh, Local Indigenous Knowledge Systems or LINCS program, as we know it, uh, as we call it here, is the only dedicated uh, program within the United Nations that specifically work on the Indigenous and Local Knowledge System. And within UNESCO, um, you know, UNESCO has quite a big mandate. We are within the natural sciences sector. And one of the reasons why we are within the science sector, like some people are asked, like, why are you not in the cultural sector? Why are you in the natural science sector? Because our main role is to create that interlink interlinkages, that interface between science and indigenous and local knowledge. And we have been working this, especially on science and policies related to biodiversity and climate change. So LINCS uh, currently hosts the IBES Technical Support Unit uh, for Indigenous and local knowledge, uh, for Indigenous and local knowledge. And I'll later on talk a little bit about IBES process. And also we host the uh, support unit on biodiversity and ecosystem services network since 2022. Uh, which is uh, the program that uh, that I support. And I'm also happy to report that last year, um, not last year, we are in 2024, two years, uh, two years ago, uh, we celebrated our 20th anniversary. So we are 20, the program is 22 years uh, old and uh, we are happy to continue um, collaborating uh, with different partners and stakeholders. Um, as you know, this is one of the broad topic and I'm not sure whether I'll be able to cover it within the, the stipulated time. Uh, but I, I'm hoping that this also will um, 
uh, ignite uh, conversation and potentially collaboration with you and your, your on your team on how we can continue to strengthen indigenous and local knowledge because a seeds uh, program is like one of the UNESCO keen, uh, keen, keen interest. And probably some of you are asking why this topic, why indigenous and local knowledge system? Um, I, I think probably this question will not come when people are talking about science. So like if you ask a question, is science important? you definitely going to get a definite answer. Uh, but when you ask people about the relevance and the importance of indigenous and local knowledge, it's usually an, an, an uncertain. And probably before we go further, I would like us to start with uh, sort of a, a small interact, uh, interactive session. Um, and uh, if you could go to Menti, you can join uh, either through your laptop, through your phone, if you have your phone, you can uh, directly scan the QR code on the screen. Um, if you want to log in um, using your computer or tablet or even your phone, you can go to www.menti.com and key in the uh, code uh, displayed on the screen. That is 44297723. Um, so I'll, I'll give um, the great team um, on this call some few seconds to log into Menti. Okay. Um, uh, this mode, uh, probably if you if you permit me, allow me to use you as your bench benchmark. So once you're able to log into the Menti, Please let me know. And probably yes. this mode, if you, it's possible, if you could set the chat link I sent to you. So if you click yes. on that yes. link, you, it's going to directly take you to the um, uh, to the Menti link. Yeah. So I sent the link, and I'm also in menti.com okay. right now. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry because I'm, I'm unable to share two screens at the same time, but I'm going to now start sharing some of the results that is coming. Um, this mode, uh, let me know whether you can see the, the uh, We are the screen. seeing, yes, we are seeing yes, the screen, uh, traditional knowledge, tra yes. generational wisdom, history, undervalued, guidance, old, Nature. Old, yeah, yes. Yeah. And and you are going to like come back to some of these term if times allows in the core. Um, so we are seeing old original nature based guidance, importance, other valued history. Um, uh, important. Okay, mm -hmm. let's just give it some few uh, seconds. Mm -hmm. So we can further reflect on this during the Q&A. Uh, mm -hmm. And then prob now I'll take us to the second question, if one everyone agrees. So the second question is, indigenous and local knowledge is incompatible with modern science and technology. So what is your feeling about this? Um, this I have to say there's no straight answer. So. Uh, feel free to indicate your feeling and your perception and thinking around it. Strongly disagree. <laughs> yeah, this one one uh, response on strong, strongly disagree. Yep, it's improved, it's in, increasing. Yes, so five people already responded to that. Let's give it some few more seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's all trending towards strongly disagreeing. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to tell you, like, uh, I, I am fun of using this question in most of the presentation um, that I do. And uh, this is the first time that uh, I'm having the team that has a general consensus um, about this. I'm really eager to hear people's uh, reflection on this as well. Mm -hmm. So already we have seven comments. So uh, you can keep um, you can keep the comment coming. Um, 
Um, so what I'll do for now, I'll stop sharing the screen and I would like to open the floor for maybe two or three minutes and uh, specifically to hear people's opinion um, about the last question that indigenous and local knowledge is incompatible with the science and technology. I, I think all of us sort of like disagreed with, with that statement. Um, so why so? Uh, well, for me, I think it's it should not be incompatible. And so that's why I disagreed. It should not be. Um, there might be a perception um, beyond our episode here, our audience here, that it might have some incompatibilities, but it shouldn't be, is what yeah, my feeling is. um we're not hearing you. you we're not hearing you sorry i i muted myself thank you so much this one for that i, I saw yeah gloria. gloria go ahead gloria go ahead on mute yeah the approach to studying them might be different but i think both are valid areas of exploration mm -hmm. yeah i i really love that road yeah yeah the approach the approach is very different, but probably like their conclusion might, in most cases, might, you know, you know, complement each other, but usually in some cases is not the case. Mm -hmm. Daniel, uh, I saw when I, I put on, uh, I stopped sharing the screen, you quickly, you know, um, you know, put on your video. I don't know whether you wanted to intervene. Oh, well, I have my hand talking. raised and I'll, yeah. um... I just want to comment. I mean, I agree with what Steph just put in the chat there. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. As a scientist, I can uh, attest that there has been pushback, uh, certainly historically. Ironically, though, at least in my field, uh, which is in natural history, we have exploited, I'm going to use that word, local knowledge for centuries. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, unaccredited, of course. Yeah. And uh, anybody who has ever worked in the field anywhere, knows that you 100% depend on the local knowledge of species, of, ex of, of the uh, resource use of those species. Um, the methodology is certainly different in how that knowledge is attained, but now there is, a, there is I think, much better understanding and um, much more collaboration within ecology, within the natural history uh, to not only utilize local, uh, local knowledge um, up front, but to also give credit in the form of acknowledgements or even co-authorships. Um, and then at a more modern level, the notion of citizen science is, is very powerful. So very carefully utilizing the, the information from non-scientists that are out there um, observing, collecting data. Uh, of course, the indigenous uh, local knowledge is more powerful because it has a, a trajectory. Mm -hmm. And it, it has usually a much more in-depth knowledge. So I'm happy to see this trend. We still have a long way to go, but um, it's certainly not incompatible in my view. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Could I just, could I yeah. just say that I agree with that totally? Yeah. But there's one problem with the local, no, local knowledge and the local cures, et cetera, is the side effects are not necessarily um, very well explored or made knowledge are, are not very well known put it that way and I think that so sometimes people take things because they're told that this will work and they have a very bad negative reaction to them I suppose this happens with um, kind of standard drugs as well mm -hmm. but as I say more knowledge means that these sort of things would not happen mm -hmm. so it's important to explore and to understand the chemical composition of these um, local uh, cures, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. I wanted to echo some of Daniel's sentiments and say I really agree. A lot of it is um, it's underrecognized, but also I think the point Patricia made there is that there has to be a holistic approach to integrating indigenous and local knowledge. You can't just pick and choose what you think you need to know. And I think also scientific methodology itself as far as i'm concerned is based in a lot of indigenous concepts of observing you know documenting to an extent but also 
again, the dependence on integrating local knowledge from those who are there on the ground. And mm -hmm. of course, the role of citizen science, I, I always say that is highly undervalued in some ways. And I think it creates a false dichotomy between established academ academia and those people and citizens who have the creativity and have the drive and have the, you know, the motivation to go out there and, and collect the data in a way that a lot of scientists can't if they are stuck in a lab somewhere. Yes, and in fact, um, just as a point of interest, University of Trinidad and Tobago, several years ago, tried to set up um, a sort of formal lab and clinical testing for um, mm. different, well, they were just picking one or two, mm -hmm. but they were actually trying to do it to bring in the science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just thought that that would be interesting. Unfortunately, that was one of these programs that uh, uh, Kel fell by the wayside because of, I don't know why, lack of um, government uh, interest or it was just one of these, I think it was a political decision. Mm. And unfortunately, that was one of the programmes that got scrapped. Okay. Hmm. Anyway, just thought that that was a very excellent programme. And they put together some very nice leaflets. I will share one with you, uh, Desmond, if you want. Okay. So yes. that you can see the sort of work that they were doing. Okay. That was unfortunately, most of it has been lost. Oh. I have copies, but that's because I'm a squirrel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> super, super, super interesting. Uh, thank you so much, Tim, for your great, great reflection. The the purpose for for me asking this question is, of course, not for me to give to give the answer because I don't claim myself to, you know, to be you know what we call like an expert of indigenous and local knowledge. But I'm a passionate about it. I'm an eager to make the society better but bringing together different knowledge systems. And I think one of the comments put on the chat by um, Katrina is sort of a good way for me to transition to the, to the next topic. And um, she, she's indicating that the science should show the natural system that guided the indigenous and knowledge would mean it is incompatible. And, and uh, one of the questions that when you're working with indigenous and local knowledge, we, we constantly need to ask ourselves, of course, science is accepted by everyone. Science is, ex expect is of course accepted by the scientists. We are the pioneers of that, the, by, by the policy makers, by the, by, by the society. But in most cases, indigenous and local knowledge component is less understood, is less accepted. So because of this evaluation of indigenous knowledge by the society and even by, by scientists, do we then have to use science to validate indigenous and local knowledge, or it is equally valid within its own system? Like we try to understand it within its its framework rather than try to bring it within the scientific the scientist framework. So probably that's one of the questions that I would like to you know to pose to the team um, to think about it as I bring back my my presentation. Um, I'm happy to come back to it if you want to ask for my personal opinion on this. As I said, I, I don't claim to be an expert on this. We are here to have the to, to have the dialogue. So um, how do we then understand indigenous peoples and local communities and their knowledge? And of course, it's not it's well known that these people often have a long starting tradition of care for themselves and also equally for the nature. And because of their constant interaction with nature, they have acquired knowledge, a precise knowledge of the earth processes, management, and even conservation that can assist in the management of uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services. And I'll be giving some of the, uh, some of the examples that have been um, uh, clarified. So for most indigenous peoples and local communities, uh you know their knowledge is not only information for them it shaped their action their decision their effort their culture uh you know their livelihood their lifestyle so for them when they look at it when they look at nature they look at it in a more holistic view 
their, the, the, their interaction on knowledge is connected to their overall community, to their nature, and even to their individual, individual values. So, so it's very difficult to separate all these things together. And because of this value system, uh, value-based system, they have a deeper and respective connection, of course, as I said, with their natural surrounding. And uh, indigenous and local knowledge in most cases has provide critical information and knowledge that we can often draw, draw upon as an alternative to, uh, you know, to, to, as an alternative so that we are able to understand the nature and promote wise use of our natural resources of living harmony with nature, as Adia, uh, you know, Marcia was talking about. And uh, as, as opposed to science, you know, indigenous and local knowledge is not, not only a board of knowledge, but is also a way of thinking and even a way of living for the indigenous peoples and local communities. And often this knowledge is tied to their, to, to their spirituality, the, to, their, to their religion. And they don't often make that distinction between empirical and sacred uh, knowledge as opposed to, to science. And this, I think, might start to explain my earlier question, whether they are really compatible with science. In terms of how they conceptualize things, to some extent is similar, but to some other extent is also different. So then why, why is that need to embrace diverse knowledge systems? I believe most of us are in academia. In academia, like one of the key aspects we always emphasize about is uh, interdisciplinary collaboration, working of together of natural science, scientists, social scientists, and even those in the humanities. But we are requesting for a further you know, collaboration beyond this to include different knowledge system to bring also the knowledge of indigenous communities, local communities, and even that of the practitioners. But why is this important, especially when it comes to biodiversity conservation or environmental issues? So when you have a certain issues, uh, when you're looking at it from different worldviews, from different lenses, mm -hmm. you could be right, but only from your own perspective, as illustrated by this, this icon here. So, and this um, perspective, so for us to have a better understanding, you have to be willing to look things from other person lens, from other person worldviews. Only then can you understand what they are seeing, but only if you're able to look and examine mm -hmm. things from own perspective, then it's become very difficult. And if you open our door to these different worldviews, then we are likely to get new insight, new perspective. And it also opens doors for a wealth of knowledge because we are able to, you know, to acknowledge different worldviews. And specifically in terms of environmental conservation, it's helped us to better understand biocultural diversity. We often talked about biodiversity hotspots. But we really think about biocultural hotspots and what that could mean when it comes to biodiversity conservation, when it comes to sustainable development, as Marcia was talking about earlier. And more equally, when we are open to this, uh, you know, constructive discussion, then it can help us break some of the barriers and probably help us build some bridges so that we can be able to connect different knowledge systems. And uh, we know environmental problems, climate change, environmental degradation, deforestation, uh, water pollution, they are very, very, very complex and often very interconnected. And, and Marcia, especially because she comes from, and you know, from the government, she can attest to this. Even them, they have to collaborate between different minis uh, government ministries and, 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 and sectors. So with these complex environmental problems and interconnected problems, then we need to be open for us to have, you know, solution to addressing them. We need to be open to understanding or viewing things from different lens. And this is where indigenous and local communities could contribute and how can they contribute on this? And I'll talk a little more about this. Of course, it's through their knowledge, it's through their customer govern customary governance system of their natural resources and understanding their ethical principles and practices. How can we embed this, for example, what Marsha was talking about in environmental conservation? In addition to this, 
when you're working for the government, government think about policies, they are guided by policies. And most of the policies that we develop because of their direct interaction with nature, the policies have direct and indirect impact on indigenous indigenous peoples and local communities. So it's important that they get to be consulted in their development as well as their implementation. And later on, I'll be talking about the Kunmin Motrid Biodiversity Framework as well as, uh, and, and maybe Marshall can also guide us on about the NBSAP on how it can contribute to this, to this process. So thinking about diverse knowledge systems and specifically here talking about scientific knowledge and indigenous and local knowledge system, so when you bring them together, you might have a more enriched pictures. You, you might have a better understanding of the environmental issues. You might have a better solution to address some of the environmental challenges that we are, we are facing. And when you bring this knowledge together, you're likely to co-produce a new form of knowledge or this knowledge, they might cross fertilize each other so that you get a better, a better picture. Uh, and and here I put like for example one of the one of example for example recently we are very interested about valuation of ecosystem services but scientific is only doing this from economic 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 point of view so they are studying the monetization of economic value and what that means if you lose a certain eco ecosystem how the, how much do we lose in terms of you know USD per capita or something like that. But for the indigenous peoples and local communities, the evaluation systems is beyond the monetary system, is much more connected to their livelihood, to their lifestyle. So when you connect different evaluation systems, you are able to get the true value provided by biodiversity and ecosystem services. And uh, of course, here I'm not going to go into the deep detail because I'm going to share the PPT. I already talked about the, you know, why it's important to engage this. I already talked about the knowledge, the knowledge and how they contribute this to biodiversity conservation. They're often considered as stewards of the environment and they often have this ethical and cultural responsibility to protect. They have their governance and management system that have helped to conserve the environment for a very long time. And I, I talked about the values, I talked about the policy, why it's important because it might be directly imparted by the policy. So it's very critical for us to, to engage the, them into this process. And here I wanted to highlight, for example, some of the key findings. I know most of you already probably know about them coming from specifically from the IBES assessment uh, on the values and the contribution of indigenous peoples. For example, coming from the global assessment that was released in 2019, it indicated that at least 25% of the global land is traditionally owned, managed and used and occupied by the indigenous peoples. And here we're only talking about indigenous peoples. If you include local communities, this figure might go even much higher. So going to one of the latest assessment on the sustainable use of assessment, which was released in 2012, uh, 2022, sorry, it, it indicates that an estimated 15% of the global forest are managed as community resources by indigenous peoples and local communities. So this signifies their direct contribution uh, globally to biodiversity and conservation management. So then how do we encourage them or, or you know provide them a platform for them to to be engaged in relevant biodiversity conservation policies i put here some of the global environmental frameworks and instruments that are supporting the indigenous and local knowledge component and i have to say this is not conclusive list and this is some of the uh, some of you know uh, some of the framework and instrument that i could you know, presented during this short time. Of course, the first one is the Paris Agreement, specifically Article 725. I don't have to read about it. You can see in yellow, it has a direct reference to traditional knowledge. Uh, when you think about um, uh, disaster risk reduction, then there's a SEDAI framework on disaster risk reduction through its guiding framework and also priority for action. You can see it calls to ensure that indigenous and local knowledge is also considered alongside science in disaster risk management as well as in, this, in uh, disaster risk reduction, you know, strategies and, and, and action. Uh, 
but probably what I'm going to do more about is the conversion on biological diversity because here I want to talk more about environmental issues and of course with article J that focus on traditional knowledge and inno innovation and practices it record for the member states and other stakeholders to respect preserve maintain knowledge innovation and practices of indigenous and local knowledge because they understand the value and their contribution when it comes to the nature uh, nature conservation. And specifically, I would like to narrow down to the Kunmin Motel Biodiversity Framework uh, of 2022, which is one of the most visionary framework when it comes to um, you know, looking at the rights and issues of indigenous peoples and recognizing their contribution when it comes to the uh, conservation of biodiversity. So if you look, for example, in different section, like introduction section, section C, section uh, sections K, they acknowledge the value of indigenous peoples and local communities, and they call for creating awareness and understanding about this great contribution in terms of their knowledge, understanding different values of biodiversity and nature contribution to people. We are talking about, uh, you know, the target uh, Kunmin Montreal Biodiversity targets uh, set to be achieved by uh, 2023. So starting with, of course, target uh, target three that which we most people know it 30 by 30, achieving 30 percent of protected area by 30 by 2030, and what this target specifically recognize indigenous and traditional territories as one of the protected areas so they understand the the, the importance in biodiversity conservation target nine uh, which focus on sustainable use of natural resources call to protect and encourage customary sustainable use by indigenous peoples and local communities through these practices and then target 19f Call to enhance the role of collective action on conservation, including my indigenous peoples and local communities. But, but probably one of the more, one of the critical critical uh, targets that really talked really spread out uh, where um, indigenous peoples and their knowledge is target twenty one and target twenty two. Starting with target twenty one, which called to ensure that that biodiversity policies and action are informed by all available knowledge information and data including that of traditional knowledge innovation and practices and te technologies held by indigenous peoples and local communities and i'll be talking later about the epic process and then target 22 um, called to ensure that there is a full equitable and inclusive effective and gender responsive representation and participation in biodiversity decision making process and justice and information related to biodiversity by indigenous peoples and local communities where respecting their cultures rights of our lands and knowledge so already uh, we already have uh, in different international framework um, Another critical international framework is the EBS itself. EBS is Intergovernmental Science, po uh, Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Or, you know, for those who don't know it, we, we like to call it system of IPCC. IPCC is to climate change, what EBS is to biodiversity and ecosystem services. It's recently established, it was established in 2012. Now it has over 140 member states. And similar to IPCC, it conducts scientific assessment on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And Adi already explained some of the assessment that has been next conducted by the IBES assessment. And one unique value about IBES since its inception it recognized the importance of indigenous knowledge and its role when it comes to conservation and sustainable use of, bio, uh, of um, ecosystems. So, and the work with indigenous and local knowledge is well enshrined within its deliverables and objective. And, you know, it's open to, you know, it's through its conceptual framework, it considers the diverse on multiple knowledge system and the different values that they, you know, that, that they bring. And it has developed different uh, framework, different methodologies of working with indigenous peoples and local communities. But what is quite unique about the IBES process, it does not only include indigenous and local knowledge system, 
in the scientific assessment, but it's also provide platform for indigenous peoples and local communities to directly participate in the assessment process, largely through what we call the dialogue workshop. And UNESCO links, uh, where, where I'm based, we host the technical support unit on indigenous and local knowledge for, uh, for eBay. So in case you need more information about that, um, I'm happy to share. But um, apart from eBay, so inspired by eBay's uh, the work that I support within the BestNet framework. So BestNet is Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Network, um, which is a consortium uh, partnership between UNDP, UNEP, WCMC, and UNESCO. So our work is to support the implementation of the IBES work. And we have really anchored um, indigenous and local knowledge through all our work streams and i have to say this work is you know sub financially supported by the federal government of germany and sweet bio of stockholm resilience so um so what we do is we try to bring some of the work that is done by the ebs at the national level and for example when you look at the uh here at the top right corner one of the key initiative is we support the countries to conduct national ecosystem assessment. Uh, for your interest in the Caribbean, we have worked with uh, we have worked with Grenada, and also we are working uh, with the, the Dominican Republic into in in, in, in this process. And uh, within this process, just to give one example because of time. Uh, within the national ecosystem assessment that is led by UNEP WCMC here at UNESCO what we do is to ensure and we work with the country partners and the others working with this assessment to ensure that indigenous and local knowledge are incorporated into the assessment uh, into the assessment process such that the assessment which is supposed to feed into a national biodiversity policy and even feed to the uh, NBSAPs is informed by both science and indigenous and local knowledge. So we try to help the country partners to be able to synthesize this, to this to, to synthesize this uh, into, um, into the process. I think probably most of you might be aware that like Trinidad and Tobago is also one of the beneficiary of what we call the Best Solution Fund. So Best Solution Fund is a catalytic fund that support for the uptake of the best assessment and uh, the national ecosystem assessment. And specifically for Trinidad and Tobago, uh, they were supported for the up, uh, uh, uptake of two inter interlink IBES assessment on that degradation and restoration, as well as on pollinators. And maybe probably you have heard about pollinators. Uh, pollinators. And if you want to know, to know more, you can Google like BestNet, Trinidad Tobago, and you can understand more about this uh, this process. And we're also happy to link you up with some of the uh, some of the partners leading this process. Uh, so I just have only two 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 more slides. Um, and here, I wanted to talk about some of the key principles that are important when working with the digital and local communities. Of course, what we call the FPIC process or free prior and informed consent is one of the critical, critical, critical principles when it comes to working with indigenous peoples and local communities. Freeze imply that um, indigenous peoples and local communities are not pressured or intimidated or manipulated or even influenced you know, to undertake any decision, especially within their territory or concerning their culture or their knowledge. And prayer means that the, the activities that are undertaken within their territory or that are affected, uh, affected them should not be initiated until the consent process has been fully uh, completed. Inform imply that the information is provided, is the information provided that which cover all the relevant of aspects, for example, of intended project, of intended policy, of intended activities, on and consent or approval is in which that indigenous communities are fully engaged and are competent and all their competent authorities are engaged and they are able to understand all this process and give approval and consent, especially when it comes to issues connected to their territories, issues connected to their knowledge issues connected to the um, you know to uh, you know to their to their culture uh, 
for for this um what we call the multiple evidence based approach developed uh, developed by uh, colleagues at Swedish Bio Stockholm Resilience is one of the critical critical instrument which explain or try to illustrate how different knowledge systems can come together to inform uh you know uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services and it is one of the key recommendation when working with the diverse knowledge system is that we have to ensure that there is an integrity into the data collection processes and synthesis and even application of that data and also it is critical to ensure that we acknowledge that each knowledge system is varied in its own form so we don't have to use one knowledge system to validate another system so for now i'll stop there um, and then pass over to the team happy to to further discuss i don't know whether i i took much of the time uh this mode and in case i did apologies for that over to you you're good you're good <laughs> don't worry about it <laughs> you're good okay daniel you want to start us off in this part um sure i mean i thank you so much uh joseph your presentation was uh very well put together and um just gave me a lot to think about in the projects I've been involved. And I can certainly attest that um, uh, there is so much to be gained by uh, partnering up and and uh, uh, working with local communities. Um, in my own research, I have worked very closely with local communities and specific individuals within those local communities, because obviously you're gonna have a, a breadth of ideas within a local community. Some will want to uh, collaborate with you, others won't, and we never pressure individuals to work with us or not. But uh, those partnerships have yielded, um, you know, it, massive results. And more importantly, for conservation purposes, if you don't have the local community working alongside, if there's no buy-in, then you're not really doing anything. Yeah. Um, there's just absolutely no way to enforce laws, policies, and rules um, on the ground if you don't have local buy-in. And so I think, that it, you know, you're hitting on a lot of really important things. Um, I do see some things that have been written in the chat and um, maybe, Steph, if you could begin, uh, you, you made a statement about the behavioral sciences. We've been talking briefly about sort of uh, uh, environmental science, but obviously environmental science ties into many different fields. I, as an ecologist, always think of these things as sort of wildlife and, and, and you know, some element of the environment. But uh, I don't really think so much about uh, the anthropology aspect. So maybe you can um, talk a little bit about what, what it is that you were talking about in terms of the behavioral sciences, when, where they are in terms of uh, local knowledge. I think uh, Steph had to take off. So she's she's not here with us, but I actually want to follow up, Daniel, with you, and hopefully this doesn't put you too much on the spot. No, no. <laughs> but could you like give us a granular example how something that you learn from local, you know, knowledge people helped you in your own research? It could be small, it could be whatever, but could you give us like a, a an example? Yeah, so obviously when I, I, I work in areas that are, are fairly remote and um, I don't I don't uh, necessarily work with what would be defined as indigenous people. I work with local communities. So these would be um, mestizo or mixed uh, communities that have some indigenous blood, but but have been quite westernized. Mm -hmm. So they, they have knowledge and access to um, some of the technology that that uh, that we all benefit from. But they also share with some of the cultural practices and and uh, deep knowledge of of their natural environment. These are people that hunt and fish for a living. So a lot of times I will come in with my book knowledge of what is supposed to be happening. And then they will kind of laugh at me and then we'll have conversations about things that they have seen or observed over the years. Mm -hmm. And it's just been very um, enlightening because oftentimes uh, I will be wildly wrong based on things that um, I learned from reading versus what they have learned through generations of information that has been passed down. Of, of, and of that doesn't mean that everything is correct that they're saying, 
but it 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 uh, on the flip side shows me that a lot of things that I think are also um, wrong. Right. So I'm I'm sort of um, thinking that maybe you might they may give you information about the time and the places and all of that where you might observe or best observe manatees, for example. I'm just trying yeah, to- Yeah, so I can give you concrete yeah. examples. Like we think we know what they eat or when okay. they're active and when they're not. And a lot of that information might be based on small sample sizes in one location, but these animals are highly plastic in their behavior. Mm -hmm. And when you're studying them in areas where they have not been studied, um, the go-to is the hunters. The hunters know these species the best. Mm. And so they will tell you uh, things that, you know, what they eat, where they're found. They'll tell you behavioral things that some of them are very difficult for me to comprehend or understand. You know, how would they know this? For instance, mm -hmm. these animals are sexually, uh, not sexually dimorphic. They look, the males and females look the same. It's very difficult to tell them apart unless mm. you see underneath them. Uh, and you can't see underneath a manatee in their natural habitat. Mm -hmm. Yet they tell you that based on their behavior, they can distinguish a male and female. Oh. I can't explain it to you as a scientist, right. but more often than not, when we capture right. these animals, they're right. They're like, yeah. oh yeah, that's a male. And then when we pull it out of the water and we do our analysis on it, um, they were correct. So, yeah. you know, there's so many yeah. mysteries out there that I still don't know what they're queuing in on. Right. <laughs> They always have a good laugh at just our ability, our inability <laughs> to see nature the way that they can see it. That they do, yeah. Okay. Other other comments, questions. Stacy, do you have any comments, questions? I know with at Island Innovation, mm -hmm. have also a very broad view and yeah, yeah capture yeah. of indigenous knowledge. Yes. Well, we try to highlight that because part and parts of Island Innovation is to see islands as a global phenomenon and see how islands, regardless of where they're situated geographically, have similarities by virtue of them being islands. And mm -hmm. that's something that really does um, highlight the importance of indigenous knowledge systems wherever islands are. And these are knowledge systems that, as Daniel mentioned, have been passed through generations. And it's that intergenerational connection as well that I think is an important aspect of traditional science that, well, science as you know, that that's missed, I think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it was a really fantastic presentation, I must mm -hmm. say. So I have a question, a broad question, not pointed at any specific person, but in the Caribbean, we have indigenous peoples, the Amerindians, they are different communities. I know in Trinidad, in Arima, Lopino, different places like that. Um, does, do we try to interact with them? Number one, do we try to interact with them on the level of what we are talking about to get and learn about their, inform their, their knowledge? Um, I don't know if Marcia could talk to this or who could talk to this, Pat and others that might be on here, but how much do we really interact with the indigenous peoples in the Caribbean? and, um, you know, get uh, insights and knowledge from them. Well, I don't think it's done enough. I am actually of indigenous heritage from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Oh, okay. It's not done enough, yeah, I'm Garifuna. So um, you could you could bestow some knowledge in us too. Well, yeah, <laughs> it take a while. But okay. I, think, I, think, um, I think what we see in some territories like Dominica is there is an aspect I think of there's an aspect of cultural heritage to me that can border on tokenism as okay. opposed to seriously integrating what the knowledge is. And then uh -huh. one of the huge issues I think in the Caribbean region and which I plan to tackle, I'm doing my thesis at the moment in island studies with the University of Malta and I'm gonna be gathering data. There's a lack of concrete data when mm -hmm. it comes to indigenous people in the Caribbean region. There's a lack of data in terms of how there might be climate adaptation practices that we can infuse into policy there's a lack of, of concrete data, particularly say how the climate crisis is impacting these people specifically. Mm. And that, so um, I mean, I have a few years of field work ahead, but that's, I'll okay. be embarking on that this year. But yeah, I think one of the issues in this region is the lack of concrete data. So after you do your um, presentation to your committee, um, we will be next. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. 
And and if I may, Stacy, um, I see an opportunity here. Um, the the premier marine mammal uh, scientific community called the Society of Marine Mammalogy, which hosts a a biennial meeting every two years somewhere. Um, will be coming for the first time, not only to Latin America, but to the Caribbean wow. in Puerto Rico in 2026. I will be helping to, to organize. I've been invited to be one of the scientific committee members. And one of the things that the society has done in, in uh, as of late is to really emphasize the uh, traditional and the, the indigenous knowledge of marine mammals in terms of their exploitation, their, their mythology, uh, the next meeting we have, the one for this year, 2024, is in Perth, Australia, happening in November. And obviously, there's a lot of, um, you know, indigenous uh, heritage there. But in the Caribbean, you know, with the individual that I'm organizing it with, well, I'm not organizing it, but he's primarily the organizer, uh, Mignucci, a well-known veterinary scientist, marine mammalogist in Puerto Rico, um, you know, we know about the indigenous people in Puerto Rico, the Tainos. I don't know if there are any left. These are like historical problems. Uh, they are because I'm yeah, part. This is yeah. another issue, right? It's so we don't exist. We we are here. We do oh, exist. Skin, right? I mean, <laughs> but I know what you like, mean. We traditionally think of sort of a pure, and this is the thing yeah. in Latin America is that we do have yeah. some sort of pure indigenous groups, but most of us, mm. I'm Uruguayan myself, mm. are are a blend, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So how do we highlight? the local indigenous knowledge um, in the Caribbean using this opportunity when we have 2000 scientists, marine scientists uh, from the mm -hmm. all around the world that will descend to Puerto Rico, to the Caribbean in 2026. We need mm -hmm. a meeting. Let's let's start to let's start to, to coalesce. I'm all I'm all for it. I have yeah. been looking for. So we'll we'll I guess we'll be in touch. Perfect. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys have each other's emails and stuff, right? Um, I have. I, I, I don't. But I will check. I can put it on the Thank you. Yeah. Okay. This mode, maybe just just as a minor intervention, like in mm -hmm. addition to what um you know Daniel was talking about, one also like two areas, uh, in addition to like coastal um, coastal areas, other areas that were indigenous and local knowledge knowledge in terms of documentation is limited, especially in the Caribbean, is the spatial knowledge. Um because you know traditionally they also had like their own mapping technique so mm. this is one of the areas that you could be able to tap in as well as the navigation like ocean navigation knowledge uh, including of women because sometimes when we think about like uh, navigation we mostly think about men mm -hmm. but if we could also think about in addition like to the marine of course marine traditional knowledge in in your context but also the spatial knowledge and also the navigation knowledge i think would be quite important and relevant to your region thank you yeah, yeah that's right that's right other, other persons with comments questions Pat, are you on? Are you or or Mars here? Anything? I am. Um, I am absolutely blown away <laughs> by this presentation and what's gone on today. I am so glad of this. Uh, so happy that I can tune into this Environmental Fridays. You come up with some fantastic. Um, <laughs> today was great. Thank you so much, everybody. My and is it possible? Good. I mean, that presentation that Mr. Karanja gave was absolutely, and the one that Marcia gave were so full of information that will be that that will be shared, will it? Because um, yes, it will, it will. Thank you. Because yes. no, that was absolutely fantastic, and it's so necessary. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Marcia, you want to say anything too? Because I see this. I was going to mention something, but of course, um, coming from a social perspective, because of my background, um, based on East, we are supposed to, um, not supposed to, but we are engaging with indigenous communities. So we have the um, Santa Rosa First Peoples. Um, mm -hmm. They are in the northeast of Trinidad in Arima. Right, and right. then we have the Rawao, R A W A R A O, Rawao. Mm -hmm. And they are scattered in the south of Trinidad in different communities like Separia, um, Ikakas, Erin, and so on. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Now, the Santa Rosa First People, so there's also the politics and the dynamics among the First Peoples. Many of the Santa Rosa First Peoples are of mixed um, blended race. Many of the Warao down south are pure. Mm. Um, what happens um, is that the Santa Rosa First Peoples tend to be more visible, perhaps okay. because where they live, um, mm. you know, it's in the Rima area. So mm. many people think that that's the indigenous group in Trinidad and Tobago. And um, we have been trying, along with some NGOs, to um, bring to the fore um, the work that the Rawal are doing in South Trinidad. So, for example, the women are very involved in in um, craft and that sort of thing because they have had received training. But um, it is very difficult. So I'll just share something with you. We were trying to get a meeting together, not last mm -hmm. year, the year before, with mm -hmm. the Santa Rosa First Peoples. And I heard through the grapevine, because we were also engaging with the Rawal, um, they were um, reluctant. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to deal with the dynamics, the politics, the, mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what you, to, to actually start the engagement, mm -hmm. to start the conversations. Um, so, so we do have um, um, some challenges there, but yes, um, there is a lot that we can learn from them. Um, it's just about the exposure and making the effort. Yeah, so we could talk offline, Marcia, about how possibly for the next season or two, mm -hmm. we can, um, you know, have them on. Yes. And with us. You know, we mm -hmm. went through the politics and what have you that is necessary, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a, a valuable thing to, you know, focus on them and for our benefit, for their benefit. It, it's, yes. you know, yes. yeah. Jennifer, Jennifer. Yes. Good morning, everybody. So I'm representing Habitat for Humanity. And um, the reason I wanted to share is because we have embarked on intentional inclusion of the indigenous peoples. What we found is that a lot of our donor agencies, a lot of our stakeholders would insist that youth and gender is considered mm -hmm. and they never invite the indigenous people mm -hmm. and all kinds of other marginalized people into the conversations. And because we are very inclusive, we are insisting that that becomes a part of the agenda. Um, as a result, we've had really, really great traction with the chief and the indigenous people. The same group mentioned Santa Rosa there. Mm -hmm. uh, we've actually completed a rainwater harvester system for them and a community greenhouse. Mm. We were looking at the possibility of some retaining walls along with the government. However, that has had its own challenges because they there's some complication from within um, and we're trying to get over that little hurdle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as the way one person donated the architectural plans. But now that the government has gotten involved, it seems like they want to be paid for the, for the gift that they give to them before. Mm. And so a little bit of yeah, yeah. <laughs> challenges. Right, so we, right. But nevertheless, to say that what they are embarking on, I just wanted to share that because in case other groups are interested in working with them, one of the ways you can do is to go, you know, supporting what they do mm -hmm. um, as against us playing that we know what we know best for them. I people. know, I know. Always the people know best what's good mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And... um. They this this village that they're creating, it's supposed to be a village that is supposed to help not only the indigenous people of Trinidad and Tobago, but they have um, regional interests. And mm -hmm. so that village should um, take a lot of other things into consideration, including income generating activities like a cassava factory, um, really grand plants, beautiful plants. And the government of Trinidad and Tobago hands allocated to them between 25 to 30 acres of land, and that is already given to them. Mm -hmm. So I just thought I'd share a little bit of that because the, the, the plan is very, very elaborate. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's going to take a long time and it needs lots of partnership involvement. So it's a good opportunity because the, the scientific 
knowledge that these people have is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's probably done in their own style and their own way, but who knows what is the right way? Right. The fact is they have the information. And if we can, you know, in our own sphere, see how we can support what they do, it's a great way of incorporating operating them into all that we have been speaking about today. I've been in and out of the meetings, forgive me, I'm dealing with several things, but I was very, very interested in all of the presentations, what I heard, and if there is any way that Habitat can support what you guys are doing, feel free, because our focus is not only on disaster resiliency, but it's advocacy, it's inclusion of the other NGOs, CBOs, other um, multinational groups, so that we can make sure the SDGs are really accomplished and that we can look at 2030 as a, as a landmark to land some of the things that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. um, land some of the MEAs that the government have signed on to, but it's just discussion and not moving off the ground. Mm. So wherever you want some action and it relates to disaster preparedness, mitigation, advocacy, awareness, feel free to call on Habitat. I'll so, post my information in the chat. Yeah, please do. And I will be following up with you uh, pretty soon. Sure. So put your information, email, um, whatever you feel comfortable with. And we will follow up and you will probably be on Environmental Fridays for your own segment. So we'll oh. talk some more offline. Thank you, sir. Take care, all of you. Um, all right. So anybody else has comments? We're getting close to the top of the hour and we probably need to head on out for whatever the weekend holds for each of us. But we would like to thank our speaker, Joseph Karanga, uh, Marcia, um, Tinto, our co-hosts Daniel and Stacy, and for all of us who contributed this was a really good interactive and that's what um, Joseph wanted he wanted us to really interact on this topic and I think Joseph you got your wish and your desire so if there are no more comments or questions I want to thank every one of you and wish you a wonderful weekend and hope to see you next week. Um, if it's Friday, it is Environmental Fridays. It is personal. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Desmond. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Everyone. Good see you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Marcia. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Is Detta still there? Yes, she is. Um, Detta is one of my tops. If this yes, is Detta that I still. think, uh -huh. she, you should contact Detta. She's okay. in India just now, but you should That's contact Detta sometime. So Detta, uh, we need to exchange. I hope she's um, listening. She's still uh, in. She's still right, in. okay. She is, as I say, she's one of my tops. You go, okay. you turn on, and you get a whole pile of information. Yeah, she was already giving me some at the very <laughs> beginning. Right, okay. Yeah, so, and so Detta, let's keep in touch. I'll make sure if you want, if you want to, I will, if you want to keep getting in touch with Detta, please make sure that I know. And okay. I will make sure she does. She's she's actually in Baroda in, in Northern India just now. Right, right, okay. exactly. Right, okay. but thank you again. It was great today. Yes. Bye for now. Okay, <laughs> Better go. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Take care. Take care.